Jill, welcome to the podcast. So great to be with you, Guy. Thank you. Uh, honestly, it's an honor. I um, It's really interesting. I've done about 100, I think I'm 160, 170 episodes in on my podcast, like I was telling you, since I started this three years ago. And your name has come up along the journey with different guests I've had on at different points. And I and I have a, a list of people to, I must reach out and see if they'll come on the show. I must reach out and see if they come on the show. And I'll make a confession. I, I hadn't seen your TEDx talk until mm. about two weeks ago, once I knew mm. you were coming on. And I, I, you know, my life is busy. I have a 10 month year old daughter, things are crazy. And I was blown away that A, your TEDx tour had 27 and a half million views on it. Your YouTube has, I think, 7 million views or mm -hmm. something like that. When you did that talk, did you expect it to have the response in any shape or form that it has? Because clearly people are hungry for what you have to say. You know, it's, um, it's interesting. When, when I gave that TED talk, no, there were only five TED Talks on the internet. So I gave it, really, when I showed up and gave that talk, I gave it to 1,200 people in the room and 300 people who were streamed in from Aspen. So I was giving my talk to 1,500 people. And little did I know that two weeks later, that thing would be put on the internet and... Ted and I got famous together instantaneously. And it was it was an amazing experience. And energetically, I call it a tsunami of energy because it was it exploded. It went to Oprah. Oprah then invited me on her website, her uh, web uh, show, which ended up being the first soul interview for the Soul Series. Oh, wow. And then uh, I was chosen as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World, all inside of six weeks. And so you can imagine, bam, my life just, it, I, I describe that energetic as powerful as the morning of the stroke when I lost my left hemisphere and almost lost my life. And and so it, so it was wild. I mean, it was absolutely wild. And and no, I had no idea uh, that it would go the way that that it went. Unbelievable! And I and I and I I, I sincerely mean this. They um, I do a lot of public speaking. You know, I I I'm, I talk in front of people a lot. But when I watched your TEDx, I was absolutely moved and blown away from start to finish. And to captivate someone like that for eighteen minutes, have them laugh have them cry, have them curious. Like you took me through all the emotional spectrums and to come out the other end, I was just like, oh, and the way, the way it ended. Like, I, I, I think I get that's moved why now. it went viral. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it ended up being a, a really powerful presentation. And, and I, you know, I led with my heart. Uh, hmm. I was willing to be vulnerable and open. And I felt like, these were 1,500 really significant people in the planet who all kind of had their own empires. And if I could influence those empire leaders, then that would trickle down in their world and in their business and in their personal life, and it would have a really meaningful spread. Um, and, and then, you know, on top of that, it ended up being what it was as as uh, as a TED talk and and TED we really I didn't know what TED was when they came to me and said would you give a talk because it, it wasn't all over the internet yet until that until that TED talk went crazy so um, so yeah TED and I have a very loving and supportive relationship of of what we've been through together I don't doubt it and you mentioned something to me then that just struck a chord which I want to pick up on about you led with your heart and you were vulnerable. And we live in a day and age where we are not encouraged to lead with, you know, everything is about right. the, the ego, the left side, the, the climb the ladder. How much of your life now you live is led from 
the heart as opposed to maybe it might have been before you had the stroke? Much more. Um, before, when I was young, I was very uh, heart based and I was musical and I was athletic and I was artistic and playful and happy and joyful and loving and all that um, until I went to college. And then I finally fell in love with the subject of anatomy. It was so beautiful. And so I began to study anatomy and then neuroanatomy and biochemistry and physiology and, you know, all of that. And it, it's, you know, we are this incredible masterpiece, just a masterpiece. And it was so beautiful to me. And so I just ended up the, the ego turned on, the academic left brain turned on. I started learning. I started excelling. I started climbing the ladder. One thing led to another. I ended up doing my postdoc at Harvard where I was uh, really training as a neuroanatomist and teaching and performing research and writing papers and doing the whole thing. And then bang am my left brain experiences this hemorrhage and it shuts down and i was very fortunate that i already had a really strong and healthy right brain and mm. i i so i never i didn't go unconscious i was conscious i was aware of what was going on through the eyes of a scientist it was really clear on the morning of the stroke I just watched the circuits break down, break down, break down, which is outlined in that TED talk. And then, you know, I ended up that afternoon, I could not walk, talk, read, write, recall any of my life. So the left hemisphere that deals with the external world and understands my past and understands the future, they were gone. And it left me in this blissful euphoria of the present moment. And it was magnificent. Yet at the same time, I was 100% completely non-functional. You have to have a left brain in order to be able to relate to the external world, in order to be able to have a life there, to know what your name is, to know anything about where you live or any data or organize or control anything out there. You have to have that left brain. But the gift that it gave me through the eyes of a scientist was when there is no left brain, what is the right brain? And then the right brain had to come in and figure out with the big picture, how do I get that left brain circuitry to function again? So that was an eight year journey, but it was an amazingly insightful journey for me. And then it ended up being insightful for the world. Wow. And you know, I was only listening because I was researching a couple of interviews and uh, and everything, one obvious thing that shines through is your positivity. Yeah. You, 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 you're I'm always happy. optimistic. You're always happy. <laughs> and, I'm happy, uh, yeah. It, which is, but, but you speak around the eight years so joyfully to a degree. Like you, you're very mm -hmm. positive about it, yet the, the yeah. experience I itself. I didn't die. I did not die that day, Guy. I <sighs> did not die that day. And because I did not die, I have lived with a sense of gratitude that anything else I have in time, whatever my condition, is gravy time. I mean, this is extra. This is bonus. I did not die. So how can I, how can I woe is me or be unhappy or be sad when I have the most precious thing that exists in the universe? I have life. Hmm. And whatever that life is, it's magnificent and it's completely different if I had no if I had a, if I had died that day. So yes, I live moment by moment, instant by instant, whatever's happening in the circumstance, I'm alive to witness it. Wow, what a gift from the from the universe. Amazing. And after those eight years, because you're um, if I'm not mistaken, a neuroanatomist. I had to look yes. that up, but it's the study of the cells within the brain. Is that correct? The anatomy of the cells of the brain. The anatomy of the cells of the brain. And yeah. after those eight years and that experience, like, and I've heard you speak as well, because once you have experiences, you're actually learning from inside. You, you, it's like you've seen it from the inside out. It's not just from a book anymore and trying to... Right make exactly. sense of the brain and so you're having embodied experiences was it then your mission to go well i'm sort of scientist version 2.0 of neuroanatomy that i've had this insight no 
No, I had zero intention of growing up to be whom I was or do what she did because she died that day. That character, that ego, that Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor at the mm -hmm. Harvard level, she died that day. And I had to let her die because I would never, ever, I was so detached from normal reality. I, I, that could not be my standard or I would just, you know, I mean, it's just like ridiculous. Um, and, and I look at me now and of course I have, well, when I lost the left brain, I lost the details, the verbiage, uh, the language of my life and of my academics. But what I retained was the three dimensional experiential perception and understanding of the present moment. So my right brain could have sculpted for you because I was a gross anatomist, a body anatomist, as well as a neuro anatomist. And I could have sculpted for you an abdomen perfectly, but I could not have named for you the three parts of the stomach because that was language in the left brain. But my body, I understood the three dimension. So I retained an incredible volume of information. But then I had to go back and relearn all the terminology through the books again. And, and of course, I was a quick learner because I already had the three-dimensional understanding, which is the hardest part for people to learn um, when they're studying the body or the brain. Uh, so it didn't take that long. I mean, within a couple of years. And then I was back to teaching at a, a medical school level. Uh, neuroanatomy and gross anatomy, but I never, that was never my goal. I really thought I would, I wanted to be a landscaper for yards. I love playing in the dirt. And, and it was like, well, you know, somebody offered me an opportunity to teach. And I said, well, you know, I've had a stroke, right? And they said, yeah, so we are thinking you're okay. And it's like, so I had to relearn all of my neuroanatomy and all of my anatomy quickly in order to teach it again. So so, you know, it was uh, people treated me with grace and uh, really set me up for a successful re and complete recovery. And, but at the same time, even though I say that, I did not give power to the character of my left brain huh. to run my life again. And of course, the two hemispheres have very different value structures. And what I gained in the experience of the right brain was the collective whole of humanity and loving one another and being open and expansive with one another and nurturing one another and and that sort of tribal connection of humanity as opposed to the hierarchy uh where do i stand on that always trying to get ahead competing with others uh materialism needing a bigger house and a uh, whatever toys and you know so so i completely lost the left brain value structure and gained the right value structure and then held on to that beautiful and we were speaking off air as well because you you had this complete right brain experience and then you had to figure out you know you come back to create <laughs> get back into the left a bit and you know and, and function in society but you said the most common question for you was hey i'm completely left brain i've completely bought into who i think i am and yet how do I get into a bit more right brain action to to create some of those states and, and be a bit more balanced with my life? Is that yes. what is that why you decided to write the new book? Whole brain? It is. Well, it is. Um, you know, the first book, My Stroke of Insight, uh, it was an amazing book. It is an amazing book for anybody who's interested in learning more about the brain, how it organizes our perception of reality, what it felt like. I take you moment by moment by moment through the morning of the stroke and what I needed in order to recover. And then what did I learn in the meantime? And, uh, and then after the Ted talk, literally over 300,000 people writing and saying, well, how do I get wow. some of that? <laughs> you know, I want, I want that piece. How do I get that? And it was like, that was a hard question for me because I was slapped out of my left brain with that stroke in two the right brain, which doesn't have language. The right brain has no language. It, it is the present moment experience and it is rich and it is experiential and it is very different than what's going on in the world of the left brain. So even though I, because I knew what skills I had lost, I could 
hook back into those. And I was very blessed to have my mother who could pay attention and realize what's the next obstacle in the way of her attaining the next goal. So um, I was very blessed to have my mother. And, um, and then I got my left brain back. But what I realized was that um, people... Uh, pay, I was giving a presentation. You're a public speaker. I'm a public speaker. And I was giving a presentation. And I said, you know, back in the 90s, it was really hard to talk about the brain because nobody, everybody would like look down and it's like, don't call on me. I don't want to hear about the brain. But now everybody's really excited about the brain and they, they know the language. They know we have amygdala and they know we have the hippocampus. And I said, but the fact of the matter is we have two amygdala and we have two hippocampi. And there was this audible gasp in the world, in the room. And I thought, they know we have one, but they don't know we have two. And what that means is they think they have one emotional system. And that's why nothing makes sense, because you can't have one system in conflict with itself. You have to have two separate things in order to be binary, in order to have conflict. And so then it was like, oh, my gosh, if the world understood that we have our, you know, we were taught uh, the right brain is emotional, the left brain is rational. And that's not true at all. The, the, both of our hemispheres are, have an emotional group of cells, groups of, of the limbic system. And then each of the hemispheres has thinking tissue. It just so happens that the left thinking tissue is the rational mind that in, re, relates to the external world. So that means we have four different modules of cells, uh, left thinking, left emotion, right emotion, right thinking. They're separate from one another and they create different skill sets. But on top of different skill sets, what I realized when I was recovering the left emotion and the left thinking groups of my brain after the stroke was that they had personalities, they had characters. And it was like, oh my gosh, we have these four very distinct characters inside of our brain based on the anatomy. And no one, there is not a good psychological paradigm that relates to the anatomy of the brain. And it's like, well, why not? I mean, the psychology comes from the anatomy. So if we think about the anatomy of the brain, what can we learn and what assumptions can we make and how can we better differentiate who and what we are as human beings based on the anatomy of the brain? And so that's why I wrote this book. Wow. Wow. Makes so much sense because when I think about what governs our lives, it really is how we think, how we feel, and we get caught in these perpetual cycles and then we get torn there's always something exactly. I found in my life, something underneath, like nagging me. It said, no, you need to go this way. You need to do that that way. <laughs> right, exactly. But yet, but yet the other part exactly. of me is like, oh, no, you can't do that. You're not, you, you know, and then all the exactly. beliefs kick in and everything else. So Exactly. So what you're saying is that this is a structure and a, and a learning that we can learn, understand, and adapt, and then start to apply that into our lives to deeper understand ourselves so we can then start making more conscious, aware choices. And it's better. simple. I mean, that's the beauty of it. The four characters we all have. It's simple. Okay, you ready? Okay. Now, I want you to name these characters as we go along. And I want you to name them because they like having an identity. And once you start naming them, then you realize, oh, I'm being this part of me, or I'm being that part of me, or I'm being this part of me, and that part of me is nagging me, right? Because now you're going to recognize them constantly. You're going to recognize them in yourself. You're going to recognize them in your spouse or your partner, in your parents, in your children, in your coworkers. You're going to notice these characters everywhere. And simply by understanding which part of ourselves is interacting with which part of another person, we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be. And this is the key to doing it. Wow. You ready? Incredible. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Character number one, I call. So if you take a human brain and it looks like this, and then you open it up like this, then your, th your thinking tissue in your left hemisphere is character one. Character two is the left emotion. 
Character three is the right emotion and character four is the right thinking tissue. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, character one, left thinking, that's your rational brain. That's the ego. That's your name, where you live, all the details about your life. It's, it's, it's your world in the external. It likes to control people, places, and things. It likes to organize everything. It cares if you don't put your, the staple back where it belongs. It creates order in the world. It thinks methodically. In methodically, it thinks hierarchically. It knows where it is on that hierarchy. It uses language to communicate. It's our type A personality. Do you have one of those, Guy? <laughs> I do. <laughs> What's his name? Uh, his name, uh, Bill. I will remember Bill. Bill. Okay, Bill. Okay, I call mine Helen. Hell on wheels, she gets it done. Okay, mine's Helen. Character number two. Now, the thing about the left hemisphere is it has our past and it has our future. It is designed to have a past, a present, and a future. The right hemisphere doesn't have that. So that's all right here, right now. Character number two is the emotions of our past. Any resentment we have, it's in our past. Any guilt we feel, it's because of something that happened before. Any shame we feel, it's because it happened at another time. These cells actually bring information in from the present moment and they take it immediately and compare it to our past experience. And it is our alarm, alarm, alert, alert, whatever here is reminds me of something in the past and I want to push it away and say no to it. And it's not very happy. And it's look, always looking for a reason to push away and say no. And it is completely dependent on circumstances from the external world because it has a past, a present, and a future. And it has the ego. And now it's all about takes things personally. It blames others. It doesn't like to take responsibility. Uh, and so do you have that part of yourself, Guy? Yes. <laughs> What are we going to name him? So uh, th what came to mind was Bill for the first one and Ted, Bill and Ted. Okay. I'm sure you have reasons for that. Okay. Yeah. So I call my little emotional character to Abby for a short for abandonment. And okay. I think the moment we were all ejected from the womb, when we're in the womb, we're in this magnificent liquid environment. It's warm in there. It's soft. We've grown from a single cell into this mass at a rate of some 250,000 new cells every second. I mean, we are a part of mama. We hear the heartbeat. We have the muted sounds. We don't have any light in our eyes. I mean, it had to have been beautiful there. And then, bam, right? We're born. Oh, my God. Right? disconnect, abandonment. I'm dealing with lights. I'm dealing with noise. I'm dealing with poking and prodding and all. Yeah, it had to have been a horrible re moment, you know? <clears throat> I go for air. <clears throat> I mean, jerking. So anyway, I call mine Abby. Okay. <laughs> Character number three is now the right brain. It's all right here, right now, right? Right here, right now. And right here, right now is a pretty perfect moment. Unless something's flying at you and you need to dodge or, you know, alarm, alarm, alert, alert. So character three is the emotion of the present moment. And it's not so much the intense emotions related to our past or our fear of the unknown in the future, but it's the experience of the present moment. How do your clothes feel on your body? How is the sun feel on your face? How, how much uh, humidity is in the air? What does it feel like to have your glasses on your face? So, so the experience. Uh, it, so this little character is our adrenaline junkie. Uh, it likes high risk because it likes to be thrilled in the present. It's curious because it's looking for similarities and possibilities. It's open. It's it's joyful. It's, it's it, it likes other people because I don't have an ego in my right hemisphere. So I'm just loving in the world. You know that little part of yourself? I do. I do. What are we going to call him? The names that come to mind is Fred. So I got Bill and Ted, and now I got Fred. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. So, so there we go. And then the thinking tissue of the present moment. When we are in the present moment and we're not having an experience of emotion and we are in our purity of thought, we are, and there is no boundary of where we begin and where we end because that's a group of cells in the left hemisphere. So we're not bound by language of the left hemisphere. We're not bound by a group of cells defining the boundaries of where I begin with a holographic image. So to my right brain thinking tissue, there is no boundary of where I begin and where I end. I am energy and molecules and in just in motion and in space and the energy of where i am here in indiana and the where you are on the other side of the planet it is just one ball, big ball of energy so what we experience here we know we have a ripple effect on the other side because we do energy has no limitation so it is our wisdom and that's the part of me that survived the stroke and it's that part of me that said, I am alive. I did not die that day. And that character four lives with a complete sense of gratitude that I exist at all. And all those details that the rest of my, my, my character three, character two, and character one are all caught up in, and the cellular loops that they're running, and I, 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 that is on top of this consciousness of peaceful, blissful gratitude that I have life. And that's your character four. And I wow. know you know that part of yourself. So what would you get? What would you name him? I, 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 I love that character. Um, but the, the names, so my, my, my thinking was, was to make sure I remember the names first. So I went Fred and then for the last one, Barney. But I, I, th I think I have to address my all four names as I restudy and revisit Good. <laughs> everything you've Absolutely. described. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. And they have to be meaningful to you. So, so my little character three, the emotion of right here, right now, playful, joyful, curious, creative. I call that one pig pen. Do you remember in the Schultz cartoon where there's Snoopy and Charlie Brown? Yeah. There's a character there called Pigpen, and Pigpen is always in a dust storm, right? There's always a mess, and he's right here, he's in the present, and he's always a mess, and he's good in his mess, and he's curious, and he's interested, and he's fun. So I call my little character three Pigpen. And I'm always a pig pen. I mean, you know, I'm I'm rarely looking clean. So you caught me on a good day. And my see my character one came online and said, Jill, you got to talk to Guy this afternoon. You can't go out and be a pig pen today. <laughs> and then and then my character four, I call her Queen Toad. And I call her Queen because I'm a queen of the universe. We all are. And well, you're a king of the universe, but I'm a queen of the universe. We all are. And I'm a toad because I'm a little bit goofy. And half my life, I live on a boat, which is my lily pad on a lake. So I call mine Queen Toad. And they are very distinctive characters and personalities. And one of the really interesting things is that when you look at those four characters, um, uh, Carl Jung's archetypes fall exactly on those four characters. So we may have a predominant one, but we all have all four. And when we get to know all four, that's when it gets really interesting because then moment by moment, I have the power to choose who and how I want to be. And if that little character too comes online and she's not happy, I can come in with my character one and I can say, am I safe? Are we safe? Is there danger here? And if there's no danger, my character four can come in and self-soothe my own character two. My character two, your character two, everyone's character two, when they get unhappy, we are our own responsibility. No one owes us and nobody really has the capacity to fix or heal that character too, except for our own little parts. So our character four can come in and say, little, little Abby, I got you. We're here. We love you. 
when you're done raging or, or warring inside of yourself or feeling negative or feeling whatever, we've got you. We're right here. If you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling angry, if you're feeling hurt, whatever it is, we got you. And little then eventually the little character feels nurtured and loved. You have a child. You know what it's like. When your little child is unhappy, what do you do? You swoop in with your love and then they feel held and they feel heard and they feel comforted. And then it's like, okay, now I'm ready to go play again. So little character three comes in and says, okay, let's go, let's go play out back. You know, let's go to the art space. Let's go for a walk in nature. Let's go do something fun. And moment by moment, this is what's going on inside of our brains. And when we pay attention and we can differentiate, oh my God, everything gets easier when you can differentiate. It's beautiful. Amazing. Amazing. And yeah, it's simple. Absolutely. It is. But the, 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 what sprang to mind then is that you, by having this framework, you, you're giving people permission to go, hey, it's okay to think like that. It's okay to feel like that. Like it's it's quite normal because we, I think we can often punish ourselves for, for being or thinking a certain way constantly, especially if we have traumas in our lives and, and right. different areas that have led us to this point in life. But what you're saying now is that we can actually start to dissect this and have a moment. And, and I think you call it a huddle. Did you call it a brain huddle? huddle. Yes, I call it a brain huddle. Yeah. yeah. So, so let's say, um, let's say um, something happens. And um, I would normally... Uh, I could take something personally. Let's say you say something to me and, and I'm thinking, uh, well, that wasn't very nice. And you know, my feelings are hurt and da, da, da. Um, and I have a choice. It's like, no, you know, I don't need to have that automatic response. I don't have to live inside of my automatic habitual reactivity and circuitry. Every ability we have, we have because we have brain cells that perform that function. So whatever I'm feeling or whatever I'm thinking, it is cells in action. And if I know that then, and I trust that, then I don't give all the power to the thoughts or all the power to the emotions. I, I look at it like the, the emotions that we feel and the thoughts that we have are like leaves on a tree and they're out there waving in the breeze, which is our behavior. Right. So I think thoughts and I have emotions and I have behaviors. But at the root of that tree, if you're having problems out there, which is our mental health, mental health is completely dependent on the brain health. And if we want to heal what's going on out in our thoughts and emotions and we go to our brain cells, those are the roots. And when we understand the roots and how it's simply organized, and that I don't have to take those thoughts too seriously. I don't have to take those emotions too seriously. I recognize that every thought and every emotion and every output of the system is a product of those brain cells. So, um, and, and then one other thing is that from the moment you think a thought, let's say I'm going to think a thought about somebody. And every time I think that thought, it stimulates an emotion. And then, and let's say I'm mad at them and I've been mad at them for 20 years, right? <laughs> because we do, right? So I think about that person, it stimulates that same old circuit. It runs the same old emotional circuit. Uh, I'm going to be angry. Uh, my physiological response then hits automatic and dumps noradrenaline into my bloodstream. It floods through me and it flushes out of me, right? It's a loop. It's a cellular loop. I think about them. I run the emotion, I have a physiological response from the beginning of the thought to the time that is completely out of my bloodstream takes less than 90 seconds. Less than 90 seconds, right? But I can probably stay angry for much longer than 90 seconds, but what I'm doing is I'm just rerunning the loop. I'm rethinking the thought, re-stimulating the emotional circuit, re-stimulating the physiological response, and then it's out of me again. So that's how then we can get distracted away from our negative emotions because another circuit came online and I got I went off to that one instead. So the brain is this magnificent collection of cells, but we have so much more power 
over what's going on inside of our head than we have ever been taught. And it's beautiful. I mean, it's so beautiful. You know, I really think by understanding this, people will find more peace simply by knowing that their anatomy, they're these different characters. They don't have to take them all so seriously. They can choose which one they want to be. Wow. I mean, to me, this is personal freedom. Absolutely. And that's massive, isn't it? The game changes once, once, once the penny drops, you know, and that's speaking from my own life as well. Once I knew that I was like, I can actually consciously start to entrain this. Have you right. found from your, you know, everything, you know, I guess I'm just speaking to the listeners to put them at ease is that if let's say I'm constantly in a certain area of my brain, like the, the left thinking quadrant, and that that's I'm, I'm thinking all the time and, and, and I'm and I'm in those states like you say and you have these 90 seconds of of that adrenaline flushing or stress or whatever it might be before it flushes and then we're repeating over time if we're willing to be become more conscious and present and break those patterns daily that we can entrain the brain to become more whole living and it becomes a new way of being if we're willing to do the work that is exactly right. And it all begins, you know, that's the ultimate goal. And I truly believe that that is the evolution of humanity. Mm. When you when you think about how biological systems evolve over time, um, it began, you know, the reptiles had uh, essentially our brain stem level of tissue. And it was mostly on off switches. I'm hungry, I eat, I'm not hungry anymore. I want to mate, I mate, I'm good, I don't need to mate anymore. Um, you know, those kinds of on off things. And then um, new tissue gets added on top of that. And then you have the mammal. And so that emotional tissue is the limbic system. And again, it's bilateral in each hemisphere. And so then over time, the kinks get worked out between that emotional tissue and the reptilian brain and new tissue gets added on top, which is the thinking tissue. So this is a progression, a natural progression of the evolution of the mammalian system with us having that thinking tissue. And so now what we're doing is we're working the kinks out between our thinking tissue in each of the hemispheres with the underlying emotional tissue on both sides. We are working the kinks out between the thinking in the left brain and the thinking in the right brain through that corpus callosum, some 300 million axonal fibers that go between the two. And we're working the kinks out between our two emotional groups of cells. And eventually, and this is the ultimate goal of whole brain living, when we know all of those characters and we create that huddle, they're all in communication with one another. And we have the power to pick and choose moment by moment, which one's gonna come out next? What is my next best? conscious choice of how i want to be in in the next moment yeah brilliant and we become more present what do you do you have any rituals routines practices that keep this going for yourself or is it become yes. so ingrained that you just live it mm -hmm. now I just live it now um, because I became, when I lost the he left hemisphere, I became the right hemisphere. I gained those values. I gained that purpose. And it was my agreement with myself that uh, I would recover as much as I needed in order to communicate with, uh, with humanity again. But I would not sacrifice. I was not willing to sacrifice the driving force of my connection to the universe. I mean, I became so clear that this is what we are. I will never step away from that. And, um, and I know that at the time of death, uh, when you look at death and uh, how the brain breaks, it starts to, to break itself down. Our worlds get smaller and smaller. The left brain slows down. Um, because it's no longer managing all that external detail and it shifts into the present moment and then it shifts into uh, the experience, true blissful experience of the right here, right now connection to all that is. So it's essentially uh, we build up away from that experience of euphoria but I see it as that experience of euphoria is a consciousness that is in every cell 
in our body. Mm -hmm. When we were that single cell, the energy of that single cell was the same as the consciousness of the universe. And that energetic then multiplied that single zygote cell literally at a rate of 250,000 new cells per second. I mean, there was a lot of genetic differentiation going on, but boy, you know, the brain wasn't doing that work. The brain was being created by that. And so by the time an infant pops out, wow. we've got this consciousness that's connected to everything that is and we look at the innocence and the beauty and the love of a newborn in amidst a bunch of screaming <laughs> don't we and that that where that is that consciousness and then we learn to to connect to the external world and we develop the skills of that left brain so that we can have a rational mind that understands and can relate to information in the external world so so i look at us as a braid of consciousness we have these four different consciousnesses the one is kind of the one holding this braid of three other consciousnesses and they're distinct from one another but you know we can switch like this from one to the other or some of us are just like a really strong character one and that's where they are and they disrespect or don't like that other character. So I think one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves is, is how well, how do these characters get along inside mm -hmm. of our own brain? And it's so important that our left brain, which comes in with all that judgment and that rigid thought of what is right and wrong and what is good and bad, that that allows respect for the playtime and for the openness because as living beings we can push but we have to pause it's like breath we inhale and we exhale there's a push and a pause but if that left brain just drives 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 pushes 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 it exhausts itself and that's the stress circuitry inside of our brain and that just dumps cortisol all over these beautiful cells making up our form and it is not healthy it's simply not healthy so so it's important to remember those thoughts and those emotions out in the leaves what is that actually doing at the level of the brain cells and how do we spread ourselves among those brain cells so that they really are at work together oh. I, I'm going to make sure I listen back to exactly what you just said again. I th it's almost, I wish everybody could hear that and start to understand that and make such a difference because I, I think, pulling it back to my life, um, with, with so much fear going on in the world right now and there's so much um, stressful situations, it really taints our perception and how we view things and that becomes our reality very quickly. But if we are willing to pause and willing to understand how we operate and come back to that, life changes. Like I've never felt more at peace in my life, Jill, at the moment, you know, and, and, I, and I give myself that time now to pause, especially since having a, a daughter. I take her in the stroller every day and that's, I'm like, my old self would have been pushing, but now I'm like, I want to be present for a while. Yeah. And, and then I have these opportunities and my reality, what I start to see in every moment and every day, changes so much to the actual narrative that we get pushed right. onto so much as well yeah and yeah. the message you bring is just so important and I, I, I if there was a way that we could get every health practitioner and people that worked in wellness to to, to go hey we need to understand how we actually function right. first so we can start to make the right choices that actually is going to influence better health right. better well-being right. more, more care more compassion right. And come more exactly. from the heart as well. That is exactly right. So, so the title of the book, Whole Brain Living, The Anatomy of Choice. Hmm. The Anatomy of Choice and the Four Characters That Drive Our Life. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it is, once you start, once you're willing to watch your own circuitry, to watch your own behavior, your own thoughts, and your own emotions, and create some kind of a structure like this, the four characters that make sense. And you start realizing, I spend a whole lot of time in my character too. And 
or I spend a whole lot of time in my character three, or my partner spends way too much time in character three, and I'd really wish he'd spend a whole lot more time in character one and help me, right? So now we have, I'll tell you a story. So I have this, these couple, they're beautiful people, um, and she is a school teacher, and she's very character one, very A-type personality, organizes everything, controls everything. She has to. She runs her classroom. She runs the kids. Half of them are on Zoom. Half of them are, you know, in the classroom today. Um, and she's very, very strong one with a strong three, but she's a dominant one. Her husband is working from home because of COVID, and he is a very strong three, but he's got a strong one. Right. So she can now call him up on the phone and say, honey, I'm coming home. And if you can give me 30 minutes of character one, then we can be character threes the whole rest of the evening. And he's going, wow, I know exactly what that means. And so he can do that. He can say, great, you know, because he's going to get his needs met. She's going to get her needs met. And then they're going to play together. So if if based on that language now they know they have communicated at a core level of what what do we need now she could otherwise she could come home and she could you know he's ready to play and she says no i can't do that yet and i need you to do this that and the other and he's going well i don't want to do that i want to go play tennis and she's going well no i need your help and now we got two twos ruining their evening together right instead of this really clear form of languaging and i just love it i love using it in my life i use i love all my friends who know the material we communicate i can call a friend up and and i said uh, okay before before you tell me about your character three how's your character one and she tells tells me what she's doing and then i said and, and how's your little two and so, you know, she says, well, you know, it's kind of tough with COVID and a cousin's got it and somebody else is ill. And, and I said, okay, yeah. And then she goes, but my character three, and then she's telling me all of her character three part and her character four is just kind of peaceful euphoria. So, I mean, it's like, wow, it's a big wow. Massive. There's a lot of, you could save a lot of marriages potentially as well with that if, uh... We learn our that's, characters. That's a goal. Start to communicate. That's a yeah. goal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. I um I got one last question for you before we wrap things up, Jill. And I ask everyone this on the show, but with everything we've covered today, is there anything mm-hmm. you would like to leave the listeners to ponder on? We have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. If we're willing to listen to ourselves, pay attention, and and interact with ourselves, we have the power to choose. And we all have that power. Absolutely. Amen to that. And your book will yeah. be available pretty much, I'm guessing, Amazon, yes. Book Deposit, all of the main Amazon, places. Yes, it's already available for pre-order, but it officially gets mailed out on uh, May 11. Awesome. Uh, will it be on Audible? as well yes i've already read it oh may 11th it'll come out on may 11th i don't think you can pre-order uh the audio until may 11 but yes it'll be on audio yeah no i'll be getting both i find it great i can go out and listen and then if there's things i want to reference to i can then just read it as well exactly yeah i like that too and at the end of each of the the because there's a chapter on character one and then there's a group of questions for, for you to ask yourself about your character one. Things like, how much time do you, do you know this character? How much time do you spend as this character? Give this part of your, your brain a name. Who likes this part of you? Who doesn't get along with this part of you, et cetera. So mm-hmm. you really think thoroughly about your character one, because this isn't about my four characters. This is about our four characters. And when you really can identify it, and that's why it's important that you name your four parts, meaningful names for you so that you can just pull, you know, Helen, Helen's on it. You know, everybody knows Helen. My friends call and Helen answers the phone. They say, hi, Helen. Can you call us later? <laughs> so, you know, I'll wait until the evening and then I'll call them as Pigpen. Because that's who they really want to chat with. Unless they need something done and then they talk to Helen. Got it. Got it. It's amazing. It, it's amazing. it is. I, I'm, I'm really excited to re- read your book when it comes out, Jill. And, um, Thank you. Look, 
thank you for coming on the show. It uh, it was truly a, an honor talking to you. Uh, everything that you're doing and thank putting you. out to the world is, is amazing. And hopefully this podcast will just continue with a little bit of the ripple effect for people out there. I as appreciate well, so. it. Yeah. I appreciate you, Guy. I appreciate all four of yours. And uh, if you want to talk down the road, let me know. Because I, I know you get it, and uh, uh, I love that. I just I wish you all the all the best, and you know, with a little daughter now uh, modeling for you all the characters, it'll take totally. a little while for the character one to hook in, but two is strong, three is strong, and uh, four is always there. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. <laughs>